Hello, I uh, hope you're enjoying our service so far. My name is Johnny, and this morning I've got the privilege of telling you about Easter and why it's so important, what it means to be in Christ and to have new life. I'm sure there are many of you watching, if not all of you, who at some stage in your life have heard about Jesus, are probably quite familiar with the story of Easter and him dying on a cross. But this morning, I'm going to act like you've never heard any of this. You don't know who Jesus is, you, you don't know anything about Easter, nothing about the Bible. And I explain to you why I'm standing here, um, why we've gone to great lengths to put this service on and to invite you. And so I guess I would start with what is Christianity? Well, the, the answer is kind of found in the name. It's to do with Christ. Now, who is Christ or what is Christ? Well, Christ is an English word that's based on an old language, Hebrew language, and it's, it's based on a Hebrew idea or, in fact, more of a Hebrew promise. And that promise is of a Messiah, of an anointed one, of a deliverer. Now, the Bible begins in the book of Genesis with God creating man and the world, and he said it was good. But then, perhaps beyond our comprehension, but nevertheless very true, sin entered the world. It, there was a rebellion against God, and that rebellion led to a separation between a loving and righteous God and sinful man. And this great division between God and man has led to the division between man and man. And so the world that you see around you today is as a result of the fall of man. It's the result of sin. To be frank, it wouldn't matter if we were to create some kind of political utopia where the right person was in charge. It wouldn't matter if wealth and prosperity were found in everyone's home. We would never escape the reality of our sin and our separation from God. And the great question of Christianity, the great question in Scripture is this. If God is holy and can have nothing to do with sin, if God is righteous and he will always come against sin, then how could we ever be reconciled to God? How could we ever be reunited to God? The Bible teaches us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now you could disagree with my words, but you cannot disagree with the reality of it. We, we see evil in this world. In fact, all you need to do is turn on the news. You could turn it on right now and you would see hatred, oppression, uh, injustice, violence. And it's been the same throughout human history. And that's the result of sin. So how can sinful man be reconciled to a just God whose justice demands that they be punished? The answer is found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that for God to bring about the salvation of man, he would do something miraculous. He would do something incredible, unimaginable, unspeakable, something probably beyond our full understanding. God would show us his love by becoming a man in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And this Jesus of Nazareth lived the perfect life you or I could never live. We have never lived. And then he goes on a cross and he dies. And he's nailed to this cross and a crown of thorns is placed upon his head. And he was whipped and beaten almost to death. And all of this was done for our sins. But it, it took more than just the physical death, the physical suffering of Christ to pay for our sins. You see, when he was on that cross, all our sins were laid upon him. All the sins of human history were laid upon him. And then the punishment of a just, holy, righteous God fell upon the head of his only son. And Jesus suffered it to its fullness and then right before he died, he cries out in a loud voice and he says, it is finished, meaning it's paid in full. You see, we owed a great debt to God because of our sin. And that debt was to suffer eternal punishment separate from God. But on the cross, Jesus Christ, God himself, he bore our sin and he suffered the wrath of God that we deserve you see, God couldn't just forgive us because he loves us, because that would make his love unjust. But he loves us to the extent that he took our place. 
and that he bore our sin. He took it all upon himself and he suffered the wrath of God. And then he extinguished it. He put it away. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And that resurrection was a confirmation of the last thing that he said that it is finished. It proved that it was finished, that it was paid for, that our debt was cleared. And so then he, as he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven and now he sits at the right hand of God. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, that those who are in Christ have new life, that no one can come to the Father except through him, Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, and his name is Jesus Christ. So a true Christian can say that they're going to heaven without being self-righteous. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at other religions, how do you get to heaven? You get to heaven by, by being good, by earning it. But in Christianity, you're not reconciled to God based on your own merit or virtue. You are reconciled to God based on the virtue and the merit of his son. I'm sure everybody watching would agree with me that there is evil in this world. There is great evil in this world, but you would never consider yourself to be an evil person. In fact, you'd probably consider yourself to be a good person. But, but imagine for a moment I had the power to take every thought you've ever had. In fact, every thought you've had just in the last year, every thought you've had from when you've woken up to when you've gone to sleep, every thought you've had of your family and your friends, your neighbors, your work colleagues, the stranger you walk past on the street, every time you're driving, every thought you've had when you're driving or going shopping, every thought you've had, and I was able to put it into a video and just started sharing it. I'm sure you would leave this Zoom as fast as you can. You would quit your job, you'd sell your house, you'd move as far away as possible from anybody who's watched that out of shame and embarrassment and guilt. And yet none of us have the power to do that. But there is one who does have the power and there is no place we can go, there is no place that we can hide. Sure, you've done good things, but all of us have fallen short of God's standard. And the reality is there is nothing we could ever do to meet that standard, to earn salvation. Our good works are like tiny grains of sand that we're placing on one side of the scale, but on the other side of the scale is this giant boulder and we're never going to outweigh it. So I, if I was to die right now, I would have great assurance that I would be reconciled to God, that I would be accepted by God. Because 2,000 years ago, Christ died in place of this sinner and he paid my debt. I do not trust in myself. I do not trust in my good works, in my religious duties. I trust in Christ alone. You may be thinking, you don't understand. I've sinned so much. We've all sinned so much. But his death is more powerful than any sin we've committed. His death is sufficient to pay for all of your sins. You might say, well, what must I do to be saved? The Bible tells us we don't need to do some heroic act, some nigh on impossible task. The Bible tells us to repent and to believe. Well, what does that mean? Repent means to ask God for forgiveness. It's more than just a general apology. It's coming to God, realizing and accepting that you have sinned and that you are broken over the fact that you have sinned against the Holy God. And repentance is also the idea of doing a 180, of, of turning away from sin and going the other direction. So repentance is asking God for forgiveness, but also saying, I don't want to live this way anymore. And to believe, to simply trust in Christ, to abandon all hope in your good works, to abandon all hope in anything else, and trust in the work of Christ on your behalf. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the great promise of God to the greatest of sinners.